All right, good morning, church family. All right, let's go ahead and get this out of the way so that you can see how gracious and humble I am as your pastor. Do we have any Longhorn fans out there? Congratulations, congratulations. You at least still have a football season to look forward to. I don't think anyone else in Texas does. We, we have all tanked at this point. Besides the Longhorns, congratulations. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 22 as we continue our walk through the book of Acts. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that and make that one as a gift from us to you. Uh, you can keep that. If you haven't been following along, don't worry. Uh, I will catch you up through the narrative today. If you knew it was your last time to hear the ocean, your ears would drink in the sound. If you knew it was the last time to taste steak, you would savor every bite. If you knew it was the last time that you were going to hug your dad, you would hold on as long as you could. Very seldom in life do you know when the last time is. In our passage today, Paul goes to Jerusalem for the last time. And it is also the last time as you work through the book of Acts that the gospel is preached openly in the temple. For so many, the last time to hear the gospel call. The last time to hear, know God, for he is near and repent. Would you pray with me? A heavenly Father, this morning, we long to hear you to hear your Holy Spirit speak to us. And we want to respond. We long to be obedient and to walk in your love and to know you. Father, as sober as this is, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days and to know that each one of them is a gift from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Paul setting his face and marching towards Jerusalem. The Spirit of God had called him to go even though the Spirit had also warned him that bonds and affliction awaited. Luke, along with other travelers and churches that Paul had planted, they would warn him, they would beg him, please don't go, but he must, because the Spirit calls him. Even though he would love personally to live out his own plans, Right? He desires to go to Rome and preach the gospel, and then to go to Spain. But he must hold those plans loosely, trusting that obedience in Jesus Christ will be glorified. Whether he lives or dies, God will not waste his faith. It will be used for eternal good. Now, in addition to Paul being obedient to the Spirit, there is another important piece at play here. 
in the narrative of Paul's life. I, I love when we can reach spots within the Bible where you can see how God is intentionally weaving together elements throughout life, like, like he is the author, he is the storyteller. Because in the narrative of Paul's life, in, in our passage here, we will realize that, that this 20 years ago, there was an incident in the temple that Paul remembers. He's going to retell it to the people when he gives his testimony today. And that was that he longed to stand before. There in the temple, there in Jerusalem, he longed to stand before those from his former life and tell them what Jesus had done, that Jesus had saved him, that Jesus had changed him. He longed to give that witness. But he was unable 20 years prior, and now he will get to. Now, I've alluded to this a couple times, but it's in our passage today. In Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 17, this is going to be in the middle of Paul's testimony, but he is flashing back to 20 years prior after he had been saved on the Damascus road and then he had come back to Jerusalem. Look at what it says in verse 17. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that, that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was shed, I was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. See, Paul gives testimony, right? And as he goes to Jerusalem for the last time, he has this deep hope, this longing, that finally he's going to be able to stand before his former life and to tell them, to plead with them, all those that he formerly knew. And we will see in this passage that that love for people, for his fellow Jews, rises above even the circumstances of a mob trying to kill him. Now, last week, Daniel did an awesome job of walking us through Acts chapter 21. That is when Paul made his way to Jerusalem. When he arrived there in Jerusalem, he was bringing a financial offering to the church in Jerusalem that he had collected from all the Gentile churches that he had planted, okay? And, and he gives them that gift to those who are struggling in Jerusalem. And catch this, the Paul who had suffered immensely for the sake of the gospel, the Paul who had planted churches and seen the fruit of hundreds of thousands coming to faith, the Paul who had healed many. He had even raised someone from the dead, okay? That Paul laid down his pride and preferences when he gets to Jerusalem because many had slandered his name because, yes, as he reached out to churches and, and planted churches in Gentile areas, he taught that it was not necessary to keep the Mosaic law in order to come to faith in Jesus. But many had slandered Paul's name and told that Paul hated the Jewish customs, that he was preaching against it, which simply was not true. And so, wanting to build a bridge so that he could keep preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, Paul paid for four Nazarite vows. He paid for it. it. Daniel described to us it was incredibly expensive. He paid for it with money he did not have, but he did so 
in order to lay down his own pride and preferences so that the gospel would continue to go forward amongst the Jews. Now, here's where we pick up our scene because Paul joins those four in the Nazarite vow in their final week. He joins them by praying and fasting in the temple every day for that final week. Now put yourself in Paul's shoes because he has come back to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit has told him bonds and affliction await. He doesn't know whether he's gonna live or die. And every day he shows up at the temple. Do you think there's some anxious anticipation every day thinking, is this the day? What's gonna happen? And on the last day of the vow, Paul is recognized, okay, in the temple complex by some Jews who knew him in Ephesus. And those those who recognize him, they begin to stir up the crowd, and they begin to shout false accusations. Men of Israel, this is the man. This is the man that you've all heard about. He is against our people. He teaches against our law and against this temple. And he has even defiled this temple by bringing Gentiles into it. Now, all of that's a lie, but it doesn't matter because the mob begins to stir up and they rush Paul. They capture him and they drag him outside the temple, intending to beat him to death right then and there. Paul, in his mind, he has to be thinking, here it comes. This is the end. But the noise of the violent uprising is seen by soldiers above who were looking down from the Atonia fortress And they quickly, they come down as quickly as they can with 200 soldiers. So that gives you an idea of the size of the mob that is hitting and kicking and pummeling Paul. 200 soldiers. Now think about how long it takes for 200 soldiers to get from up there, down there. Now I want you to think about how long it takes for a mob to inflict pretty severe damage. Not long. Every second counts. When when the soldiers pull the mob off of Paul, undoubtedly he is bleeding profusely. Probably has broken ribs from the kicks that he has taken. The commander who has been thrust upon a scene, he has no bearings. He is very confused. He assumes Paul to be an Egyptian and a troublemaker who had had caused an uprising months back. The mob continues shouting death threats. Paul surprises the commander by speaking to him in Greek. To which he says, okay, I guess you're not that Egyptian that I thought you were. Now, he is, the commander's a little stunned now by his miscalculations. And Paul asks him, and so he grants that Paul can address the crowd. Now in Acts 22, standing upon the steps just outside the temple, before a captive, hostile audience, Paul gets to share his testimony, the gospel with an angry mob. So picture this scene, okay? And comprehend his love for those who just beat him to a bloody pulp. Okay? For 20 years, he's been longing for this moment to be able to share with his former life that Jesus changed him and that the good news is for those who are like he was. 
also remind yourself quickly how you would respond. How quickly you would say in your mind, just get me out of here. Get me somewhere safe. In fact, to hell with these people. But rather, Paul's love for Jesus and his hope in the gospel allows him to rise up above an angry mob. He speaks to them in Hebrew. And the crowd is shocked and they quiet down. First thing I want us to notice as Paul shares his testimony is the brilliant way that he connects with the audience. He intentionally tells his story in a way that connects. He says, I grew up as one of you. Look at verse three. I am a Jew born in Tarsus uh, of Sicilia, sorry, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you are today. Okay? Just as you are today. I persecuted this way to the death. Now, the way is what they called Christians, okay? I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. And also the high priest and all the council of the elders, they can testify. From them, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. Church, it is fundamental that you and I connect with people before preaching to them. Okay? Whether you're doing what I do and you're standing before groups of people, or whether they're one-on-one. -on -one. You must learn the art of connecting with people. One day I walked upon the campus at a and and I walked into a figurative hornet's nest. There was a spot on campus that you, any group could rent uh, right outside the student center, little plaza, and I walked on this day, and there was a group of Christians that were there to evangelize. And their mode of connecting with people was to march in a circle holding signs that said, you are going to hell. That was their mode of connecting. Walk around in circles. Needless to say, all that did is fire everyone up no good conversations took place. Please notice here that even to an angry mob that just beat him, Paul doesn't start with, you're all going to hell. <laughs> Rather, he started with, I am a Jew, and I grew up as you, as a Pharisee. You have heard of my reputation. I am the one who hated and persecuted Christians with more passion and zeal than anyone else. I understand your zeal that you have today. He connected with them. And then in verses 6 through 11, he told them what God did while he was on his road to Damascus. The resurrected Jesus appeared to him. God stepped in. God moved. God opened his eyes and confronted him for his persecution, revealing that all of his own efforts were not pleasing to God, but rather he was found fighting against God. 
And in doing so, in telling his testimony, Paul opens up with a self-confession that with all of his zeal and all of his passion to keep Jewish customs and even God's law, he had actually missed God's Messiah. He was so blinded by his self-righteousness, he didn't recognize God's own son until he was literally blinded by seeing his resurrected face. And then Paul unfolds to them how Ananias, who was a devout man in keeping, had a great reputation of Jews who kept the standard of the law, how he too had heard from God that God had a special mission for Paul, that he was to witness to all men. Now, up to this point in Paul's testimony, he has connected with his audience. It is personal. It is compelling. And if he stops here, he probably keeps the peace. Okay, before that mob, they've listened to him. Many of them would have been convinced that that he was simply misunderstood, okay? That he had an intriguing encounter for them to all consider. But Paul doesn't stop there. He has waited 20 years for this moment, and he will not miss his one shot. Because with the next details, Paul will pivot and he will press them. He tells his story in such a way that demands action. So continuing from 20 years prior, after that conversion on the Damascus Road, he goes back to Jerusalem. This is the part we read earlier. Let's read it again in verses 17. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get up out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, well, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was also standing by approving and watching out for the coats who were slaying him. Now, in this account, okay, what Paul has done now is Paul is no longer standing on the wrong side of God, okay? Rather, the audience is now standing on the wrong side of God. The audience is one who is fighting against God. It's artful, it's strategic, it's compelling. And Paul is saying, I used to be on that side. I understand that side, but listen to me. And Paul begins to plead. In fact, he prays and he begs God, God, allow them to see, allow me to give testimony that they have missed the Messiah and that they are fighting against God. See, what Paul does here is he does not leave this in the category of, guys, we've just simply misunderstood each other. No, he presses them a call to repentance. You must repent. You must call upon Jesus. You must be saved. And then finishing the account in the temple, Jesus replies to Paul in verse 21. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And they listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and, and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not even be allowed to live. Now, what did Paul say here that was so offensive? 
that they listened to the whole testimony up to this point. And this point was Jesus saying, go, for I will send you to the Gentiles. And after that, they said, no more. He shouldn't be allowed to live. Death to him. What did he say? What does that state? Go, for I will send you away to the Gentiles. Two things. One, it means that the gospel is greater than the Jews. That the gospel is for Jews and Gentiles alike. It is for all to come before God equally. It, it, is, it is not just for churchgoers, not just for people that were raised in church. It is for all saints and sinners alike. And secondly, that the gospel is moving forward with or without you. This train is leaving the station. Get on board or be left fighting against God. And by the way, those that you have felt superior to are by the thousands getting on board. That is what the audience heard. And it's why they begin to shout death threats and why they will take oaths in order to kill Paul. And yet it is the truth. I need you to recall with me the way that when you read through the book of Acts, God insisted that the early church preach the gospel in the temple complex over and over and over again, okay? In Acts chapter two, when we're told that the spirit falls and Peter stands up and preaches a sermon and 3,000 are saved and baptized that way, that day, the only, that, that didn't just stay in the upper room. Okay, theologians are pretty confident that spilled over into the temple complex is that's the only way you can get 3,000 hearing the message and saved and then baptized that day. That's Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, 46, we are told that the early church is meeting daily in the temple courtyard. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are walking into the temple and right outside, they're in the temple complex, but right outside uh, the the where the, the men and Jewish women would be able to go in, they heal a lame beggar, someone who was well known by everyone. And, and it stirs the entire temple complex into a, that guy got healed, how did he get healed? And he's up and he's jumping around and right there they preach to the masses, telling all about Jesus has healed this man, right there in the temple complex. Well, John and Peter are arrested. They're warned by the Sanhedrin, stop preaching in this name in the temple complex. But they can't stop. Acts chapter five, all 12 apostles are back at the temple complex preaching in the courtyard and all 12 are arrested. They're thrown in prison and in the middle of the night, an angel comes and breaks them out of prison. You remember what the angel said to them? Go back to the temple. You must go back to the temple and keep preaching in the name of Jesus. And on and on. And Stephen is stoned for preaching in the temple. You see, God sent his very best to give witness to the gospel in the temple so that the masses, so that the most people would hear about the name of Jesus and be saved. And now... Decades later, as you're reading through the book of Acts, here is one last chance that Paul has been called by the Spirit of God, go to Jerusalem. And he's like, I'm going whether I live or die. I trust God. I trust Jesus. And Paul goes there into the temple and again gives testimony and a call about Jesus. Come and be saved. Now consider the patience of the Lord. Consider the long suffering. Consider the persistent attempts of God. But just around the corner is 70 AD 
where Jerusalem will be destroyed, where the temple will be destroyed, and Israel as a nation will be no more. Jesus had warned, okay, it is coming, and not one stone will rest upon it. It will all be toppled down. And the very thing that causes the Jews to shout out with death threats is is Paul's warning within his testimony that said, listen, the gospel is going to the ends of the earth with or without you. And if you don't repent, you will be found fighting against God. So friend, with kindness and sobriety, I declare to you, the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And God will accomplish his purposes, even here in Bernie. And he is calling you. And he loves you. And he sent his son for you. Repent and believe. But if you do not respond, he will patiently call. But friend, there is a point when he will no longer call. When there is a final call. But you don't know when that final call is. Today, scripture says, today, while it is still today, do not harden your heart. Repent and believe. Be saved. I had a friend at my last church in Plainview. His name was Elijah. He was a uh, professed agnostic, struggled with faith, but he had lots of questions. And so we began to meet. And we would meet weekly or every other week and He would ask his questions, and I would answer them. And after I was done answering his questions, I would tell him the good news of Jesus in the most compelling, compassionate, and yet yearnful way, right? And then I would offer the gospel to him. And he would say, I'm I'm not quite ready. And he would come back the next time and he said, you almost had me last week. I almost believed. But I went back and I read some authors that he liked to turn to who would encourage him in his disbelief. This happened multiple times. You almost had me believing until it didn't, until it stopped, until he no longer desired to meet, he stopped altogether. Why? Because he had hardened his heart and the Spirit of God stopped calling him And I pray for him. I pray that that is not the final call. Spirit of God, continue. Please send someone else. Call him. Friend, what about you? Today, while it is still called today, would you hear Paul's testimony? Would you hear my testimony? Would you hear your friend or your neighbor's testimony about Jesus? And would you be saved? Why do you wait? Why do you say in your heart, let me continue to live as I live, and tomorrow, then I will come to him? 
Why do you look upon the Lord's kindness and think maybe in the future? Do you not understand that he is calling you? Do you feel a conviction over your sin? Have you heard the good news? The good news that God draws near, that he sent his son to die in your stead so that you might know him, so that you might have life. You think that you will just live your life and you will be happy and then you will get that fire insurance, that salvation. But what you do not realize is that there is no life outside of him. He is the one who spoke you into being. He is the one who holds you and sustains you. And not only that, tomorrow is not promised. Why do you wait while today is today, while God is patient while he is offering his son call upon him repent believe come to him do not be like jerusalem who had witness after witness after witness and still said no your good works won't save you only faith in jesus christ will you pray with me our heavenly father Right now, everyone under the sound of my voice, God, I pray that your spirit is calling, is calling, and that in obedience to that faith that we would repent and believe. Those of us that have known you and walked with you, we are still called to respond to your gospel. And to ask you, Father, to examine us. We surrender and we welcome you to take more and more and more of us. And Father, if there is anyone here this day that does not know you, that right now, in Jesus' name, that they would call out in faith, surrender and be saved. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.